<laughs> Good evening. My name is Fred Davey, and I'm the Executive Vice President here at Union Seminary. And on behalf of Union's President, the Reverend Dr. Serene Jones, who is actually traveling back to the seminary uh, as we speak, I'd like to welcome you here tonight uh, for this event. I want to offer a very special welcome to Vice President Gore and Catherine Flowers. It's always good to have you back here at Union. Um, I will more uh, formally introduce Catherine um, in a minute, who will in turn present to you uh, Vice President Gore. Just one note, when this event was originally advertised and announced, we were to be joined by Hindu Omaru Ibrahim. But due to unforeseen circumstances in her situation, she cannot be with us tonight, but sends her greetings from Chad. In 2011, as a part of its strategic plan, Union adopted a goal called Reimagining Faith in the Public Square. By that, Reimagining Faith in the Public Square, we meant to ask, how do we continue to be inspired by faith and spirituality to address real life issues confronting our communities, our constituencies, our congregations, our centers of spiritual and secular life, whether here in New York or across the globe. No other issue cries out for faith and spiritual response from all sectors of our society than the ongoing destruction of our planet. Union is fortunate to be able to give a home to and partner with Corinna Gore and the Center for Eth Earth Eth Ethics in our answer in part to the cries of our faith and spiritual constituencies to address the degradation of this divine and sacred creation. The Center for Earth Ethics grew out of a groundbreaking Religions for the Earth Conference conceived, planned, and implemented by Corinna Gore, who, by the way, is a 2013 graduate of Union Seminary. That conference was held at Union Seminary in September of 2014 and it brought together over 200 religious and spiritual leaders from around the world to reframe climate change as a moral issue and then to galvanize faith-based activism to solve it. In the wake of that historic gathering, Corinna said, it is clear that Union's convening power, location, and social justice legacy made it an ideal center for generating effective dialogue about the moral dimensions of this crisis and also training people to be leaders in the transformative change we need to end it. Training leaders in the need, in the transformative change we need to end this crisis. That is why we're here tonight that is why we are here at this gathering over the next couple of days, to continue this transformative change. A force, a major force in this transformative change is Catherine Flowers. Catherine Coleman Flowers is a senior fellow at the Center for Earth Ethics here at Union. She is the founder of the Alabama Center for Rural Enterprise Community Development which seeks to address the grassroots causes of poverty by seeking sustaining, sustainable solutions. She also serves as the Rural Development Manager for the Equal Justice Initiative, serving the citizens, of, the citizens of Loudoun's County, one of the 10 poorest counties in America's Black Belt. 
Catherine has been able to bring significant resources to address its many environmental and social injustices. Specifically, her work at the center addresses the lack of sewage disposal infrastructure in Alabama's rural Black Belt, the legacy of racism and neglect stretching back to the time of slavery. Catherine is also an internationally recognized advocate for the human right to water and sanitation and works to make the UN Sustainable Development Agenda accountable to the front lines of communities. It is my pleasure to welcome back to Union and to present to you Catherine Flowers, who will present to us <laughs> Vice President Cora. Catherine. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is a test that I'm delighted to, to do. Um, a few weeks ago, former Vice President Gore and I were at the opening of the Lynching Memorial and Museum in Montgomery, Alabama, where we had the opportunity to present and talk about uh, the intersection between environmental justice and climate change. Uh, I learned about climate change really by watching an inconvenient truth. When I saw that film, it put into context what I had been seeing as a person, growing, a country girl, growing up in Lowndes County, Alabama, and realizing that palm trees were growing in Montgomery now that could not live there before. Also seeing the changes in terms of animals that generally, I was a history teacher and I taught geography and I knew that part of, uh, that if you saw animals that lived in arid areas, that meant that there was a lack of water and things were changing. And I started to see changes in terms of animals that were living in Alabama that did not live there before. So when I saw an inconvenient truth, it helped me to understand what it was and put a name to it and it was climate change. And although uh, there's a lot of things that I can tell you about former Vice President Gore in terms of his work in environmental justice and being one of the first to sponsor, along with John Lewis, an environmental justice bill many, many years ago before it was popular. The one of the things that I think that he's done a service to for, the, for all of us, including my grandson, who I talk about a lot and we'll talk about again later, is the fact that he has put it on our minds about what we can do to be better protectors of the earth and the resources that God has given us so that we can all live a life where we have access to water, sanitation, and all the other things that are necessary to lead a decent life. So I present to everyone here today, it is my divine honor to present to you former Vice President Al Gore. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to get my slideshow sh clicker here. Um, Catherine, thank you. It, it, um, it really is a privilege to be introduced by Catherine and to share this uh, stage with her. As she mentioned, we've got kind of a road show going, the two of us, and uh, uh, it's all, I always learn a lot from uh, Catherine, and I admire her tenacity and advocacy, and she just had a brilliant op-ed in the New York Times and so many other things. Um, but anyway, thank you so much, Catherine. And Fred Davey, the executive VP of Union, a personal friend, thank you very much for kicking this off and for everything that you do. Uh, I'm going to lose credibility if I say everything that's in my heart about how proud I am of my daughter, Corinna Gore, the head of the Center for Earth Ethics. But uh, I am really and truly just so proud of her, and I have learned so much from her. That's not a throwaway line. It's uh, really and truly the case. And I want to thank uh, Andrew Schwartz uh, and... Corinna's whole team at the Center for Earth Ethics. Uh, you all do a, a wonderful job, and it's 
a privilege. Uh, it's a privilege for the Climate Reality Project and the Climate uh, Speakers Network uh, to partner once again with the Center for Earth Ethics. And I want to acknowledge uh, Hal Connolly, the COO of the Climate Reality uh, Project, and uh, Jill Linus, uh, who's worked so hard on this event, and Rebecca Cipolletti, uh, thank you very much. And I think uh, Carla Brolier is here as well. Uh, so I was asked, I'm going to give a, a full slideshow uh, tomorrow during, the, uh, d during uh, tomorrow's uh, session, but I was asked for this public event to uh, put together a smaller number. Uh, just to kind of give an overview of the issue of climate and water uh, and, and environmental justice. So I have kind of a slideshow genome with uh, 100,000 slides, and I picked out a few of them, and <laughs> literally, uh, but I've picked out, uh, and they're all right there in that computer, uh, but I've picked out a few of them and made some uh, new ones to try to do justice to this topic. But I'm going to start with uh, one that um, echoes my own uh, Judeo-Christian uh, tradition. So for those of you from other faith backgrounds and traditions, uh, please uh, realize I'm not proselytizing. That, that's hardly ever done here at Union, as I understand. But, and by the way, since I last spoke here, uh, Union has lost James Cone, and the world has lost James Cone. And I know there have been many memorials and tributes, but I want to personally uh, acknowledge uh, that, that loss and uh, the respect uh, that for Union that's deepened by the very fact that uh, he uh, found a, a productive and fertile home here for so many years. I need sound. Oh, I'll be. It'll, it'll be okay. Let me start that over. The part I want you to hear is about the waters. This was on December 24th, 1968. We are now approaching uh, lunar sunrise, and uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. This became known as the Earthrise picture, and it changed the consciousness of humanity about the Earth. Within 18 months of this picture being seen, uh, the Clean Air Act, the Environmental Policy Act, and major environmental laws in many countries were, were passed. Uh, President Johnson, uh, who uh, was then, uh, at the end of his presidency, uh, sent this picture. We didn't have you know, the internet and pictures weren't transmitted easily in those years, but he sent it to every head of state of every nation in the world, including uh, Ho Chi Minh and North Vietnam. Uh, this is the last picture taken by a human being from far enough out to see the entire planet on the last Apollo mission on the way back uh, from the moon with the earth and the sun and the moon all lined up so the disk is fully illuminated. 
And of course, uh, we've heard many uh, references to Scripture, and uh, I've so enjoyed being with my colleagues at this uh, meeting all day, starting with the lovely ceremony uh, outside uh, this morning and looking forward to all day tomorrow and tomorrow evening and Saturday uh, morning as well. Um, of course, uh, the uh, tend and keep, or uh, dominion, has frequently and famously been confused with domination, uh, but uh, uh, it's pretty clear when you study it. Um, and in Islam, we heard some lovely references from both uh, Hinduism and Islam and many Native American traditions uh, this morning. In, in every tradition, the duty God assigns to humankind is to take care of the earth. I learned from a truck driver in adult Sunday, Sunday school in New Salem Missionary Baptist Church in Elmwood, Tennessee, that the purpose of life is to glorify God. And if we are heaping contempt on God's creation, then maybe that's inconsistent with uh, the purpose that we are assigned in our lives. This is a relatively new scientific finding, and it's kind of mind-blowing for me. Uh, sometimes we read these things in science, and they'll revise them along the way, but this one's held up a little bit now. When, when uh, before the, uh, the, the earth, um, there was water. And astonishingly, uh, up to 50%, and some say even more, of the water that we now have on the earth existed before the solar system existed and was brought here by uh, asteroids. Uh, and four billion years ago, they tell us, there was uh, something called the late bombardment with uh, an amazing number of asteroids. And in the New York Times last week, there was a set of experiments showing that, uh, no, the water's not uh, destroyed with the asteroid collision. But it's kind of astonishing to me that water has uh, an eternal quality in the sense that it actually predates uh, much of it, at least, uh, the Earth itself. So uh, the water cycle is well known, and we all learned it at a young age, but I mention it here because uh, this uh, cycle, this system, with the uh, evaporation of water vapor off the oceans, uh, moving over the land and falling as precipitation, and then finding its way, sometimes rushing, sometimes meandering, through streams and rivers back to the sea, this entire cycle is being disrupted by the climate crisis. And this cycle is actually very important to us, and we're 50 percent water, uh, actually they say 50 to 75 percent, uh, women more toward 50, men uh, more toward 60. Um, in any case, uh, we're heating up the, the temperature of the Earth dramatically. I think everybody knows that. 17 of the 18 hottest years ever measured with instruments have been the la in the last uh, 18 years. Uh, and the four hottest have been the last four. Uh, and the reason this is happening, as most people now realize, is that the sky is not as it appears viscerally when we walk outside on a clear day and look up at a seemingly vast expanse. It's worth remembering what the scientists have long told us and what these pictures from the astronauts uh, uh, prove, that th the sky is actually a very, very thin shell surrounding the planet. And the volume of all the molecules uh, in that space is way smaller than it would be if it was a big, vast expanse. And the power of human civilization now with 7.62 billion people and technologies a million fold more powerful than what our grandparents could have imagined and short-term thinking that blinds us uh, too often to the longer-term consequences of our present day decisions. We are now having an impact on the chemical composition of this sky because we are putting 110 million tons every day uh, of man-made heat-trapping gas. The CO2 is the most important one, but methane that leaks from fracking and pipelines uh, is, a, is the second uh, worst, and you have all these other 
chemicals, uh, nitrous oxides, etc. Uh, and as a uh, consequence, the amount of energy trapped by the, the accumulation of man-made global warming pollution now traps as much extra heat energy in the Earth's system every day as would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every 24 hours. And uh, it's a big planet, but that's a lot of energy. Uh, and as temperatures go up, so does uh, the need for and demand for water uh, for people, for crops, uh, for animals. Animal agriculture is a big player for the production of energy. Coal is the thirstiest source of energy. They have to use a lot of water for mining the coal and washing the coal and then for the water for the steam and for cooling the uh, uh, the uh, steam turbines, and it's an enormously, uh, it's a profligate use of water, nuclear also, um, and uh, industry. But if you break it down into uh, the categories that <coughs> appear worldwide, just a little over 10% is used domestically by people, and we heard today that very, a tiny portion of that is our actual uh, com consumption. We use it to take waste away and to wash things and so forth. 20% roughly is by industry, but the big player, 70% or so, is agriculture. And actually, we consume 500 times as much water in our food as we do in the water we drink. And all over the world, agriculture is the dominant uh, user of water. So when we talk about water and climate, we're talking about food and climate also, but maybe that'll be a theme in a future year. Uh, so we store water in cisterns and man-made reservoirs and lakes and rivers. We heard a beautiful presentation on the Hudson River at lunch today. Gosh, I learned so much from that. Underground uh, aquifers. Uh, it, when I was a boy, during the times I grew up on the farm in Tennessee, we had, uh, we drew water with pumps uh, from an underground aquifer. And I remember when my dad, Karen and I have talked about this, got a dowser with a, uh, uh, some, some people don't know what that is, but uh, they'll get the right kind of stick and it'll, they say, pull down when they find uh, water. I, my father, who was one of the most ultra-rational persons I've ever known, believed in dowsing. Uh, ice and snowpacks in places like the Andes and the Alps and the uh, Himalayas, uh, this is a major source of water. And forests store a lot of water, uh, and they call the rain. So water availability, how does climate affect water availability? I'm not going to cover every single one of these. We don't have time, but the melting of ice in those regions that depend on that uh, is obviously a problem. Sea level rise uh, has many consequences, but one that's underappreciated <coughs> is that even before the land is uh, flooded, underground freshwater aquifers uh, near the coasts are invaded by salt water. And I'll show uh, some examples of that uh, tomorrow. And of course, the rising heat uh, pulls the soil moisture out of the ground, and drought is a major consequence. And runoff, when the pattern changes and we get most of the rain or a much larger percentage in big downpours, then the water doesn't gently soak through the soil and recharge the aquifers. It carries the topsoil out. We had a brilliant presentation this afternoon uh, 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 about that, uh, how that hurts uh, cropland. And then the demand increases, uh, as I said, largely as a function of temperature. Water scarcity now affects more than 40% of the world's population. Uh, and it is expected to uh, increase. Maybe there are some solutions. We don't have time to go into all of the things people are working on. Uh, but. Water shortages, uh, the Climate Reality Project, uh, I, I did a three-day training in uh, Mexico City last month, uh, and the water shortages uh, there are replicated in many other parts uh, of the world. 
And according to UNESCO, in an announcement uh, just two months ago, uh, the number of people who could face water shortages uh, midway through this century could be as many as five billion. Uh, so I, I, I don't know how to unpack that number, but uh, UNESCO generally knows what they're talking about. Now, back to the, uh, in, the relationship between this extra heat that we're trapping and water on Earth. I showed the uh, increasing air temperatures, but 93% of all that extra heat is going into the oceans. And when I referred at the beginning to the disruption of the water cycle, this is one of the major uh, causes of this disruption. Uh, ocean temperatures have been increasing very dramatically. I'll show some more evidence uh, tomorrow. It now goes deep down below 2,000 meters in the ocean, uh, and it, it has a lot of serious uh, consequences. And last year, if you just look at uh, the ocean temperature, was the hottest ever recorded. Second hottest air, uh, 2016 was the hottest. But ocean temperatures are increasing, and one consequence of that, as people know, is that when uh, ocean-based storms come across uh, much warmer water, the wind speeds pick up, the amount of uh, moisture content increases uh, dramatically. And Hurricane Harvey last summer crossed parts of the Gulf seven degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal. A study was just uh, published uh, 10 days ago. In, in climate science, it's really an historic study but because for the very first time, they have actually specified exactly uh, how the extra heat uh, lifted an extra amount of water vapor from the Gulf, which they've measured precisely, and it exactly matches the amount uh, that was dumped on Houston, Texas, and the surrounding areas in Texas and Louisiana. <clears throat> Houston got five feet of rain in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and of course, uh, you, you, you try to figure out how to quantify this. We, talk, we heard reference to Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls water was in this bowl this morning. If you think about the full flow of the U.S. and Canadian Niagara Falls, and imagine how much water goes over those falls in 500 days, that's how much water was dumped on Texas and Louisiana epicenter, Houston, Texas. Uh, and of course, the suffering, I'm not going to show you a bunch of these slides, but these people in a nursing home up to their waist in water, it, it just broke my heart. But there were heroic rescues, and these things uh, often bring out the best in us, and we should celebrate that. I'm going to skip over Hurricane Irma, which came immediately afterward, and just mention Hurricane Maria. Uh, because it, it, uh, uh, it was so soon after Harvey and Irma, but it utterly devastated Puerto Rico. And as you probably saw in the news, they have just now gotten around to telling us that 4,600 people at least, and maybe more than 6,000 people, were killed in this storm. I don't know why they kept saying it was 63 people or whatever they said, but more people were killed by uh, Hurricane Maria than were killed in 9-11 or that were killed in Hurricane Katrina. And I know this is a sacred place, but I'm going to say anyway, uh, as an American, I, I think it is a, a disgrace and a racist shame that these people, these our fellow Americans, were not cared for in the aftermath of this hurricane. <laughs> I added this slide after our last uh, session because there was a lot of talk about uh, Typhoon Haiyan uh, um, and, and uh, uh, Bishop Baltimore uh, talked about it uh, and we have a, a colleague from the Philippines and uh, Yolanda, they have a whole separate nomenclature in the Philippines. This crossed uh, waters uh, of the Pacific seven degrees, same increment as uh, in the Gulf of Mexico last summer, 
uh, and it caused four and a half million uh, climate refugees. I heard some higher numbers uh, today, but I went there also after this event. And of course, Pope Francis uh, is so inspiring in so many ways, but it touched my heart that he almost, just to maybe a couple of months after this, went to Tacloban uh, and preached and comforted uh, as a pastor. And he made uh, a point he often makes, that the gravest effects of all the attacks on the environment are, are suffered by the poorest. This is true everywhere, and it's the reason for so much environmental injustice here in the United States. Now, back to the water cycle and the heating of the oceans as the beginning of the disruption of the water cycle. This is from a supercomputer, and what you're seeing is not water, it's water vapor. And the amount of water vapor that rises off the warmer oceans is quite significant. Uh, and the warmer air holds more water vapor. Hot showers steam up the mirror, cold showers don't. Uh, there's, a, there's been a 5% increase in average humidity just in the last 30 years worldwide. Uh, and so we get these uh, atmospheric rivers, heard reference to it earlier today, um, but they're much bigger now and they contain more water. The Brazilian scientists first discussed these, calling them flying rivers. This is Hawaii um, and this is Silicon Valley and this is an atmospheric river. And the day this satellite picture was taken, this was going on in the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, so these rivers uh, bring rain bombs, as some of the scientists now call them, the huge downpours. And as someone was saying in an earlier session, a lot of uh, smaller localized downpours that actually dump a huge amount of precipitation in a discrete area. I have some slides of that, but I'm not going to show them to you. But these little, little rain bombs and huge rain bombs are creating uh, havoc in many, many places. You probably saw just uh, three days ago in Ellicott City, Maryland, uh, a once in a thousand year flood because of a downpour. They got, I believe it was eight inches of rain in six hours or something like that. Uh, and I paid close attention because I know a lot about Ellicott City. Just slightly less than two years ago, uh, they had another once in a thousand year rainfall. And I've used this in my slideshows for the last uh, two years. Uh, I, I, I quit using it because, you know, now I use what happened last week or the last, in the last month. But the fact that this city has gone through this uh, twice in two years, you're not supposed to have uh, two once in a thousand year events uh, in two years. Uh, now, th this is a woman trapped in her car and they form a human chain. And I'm showing you this because I'm on the board of Apple and I want you to appreciate the fact that she puts her iPhone uh, in her mouth. This <laughs> Corinna's not as enamored of the digital world as I am, but I try to get a little humor in here. It's tough stuff. Uh, this was uh, just three weeks ago in um, Ankara. Um, and actually, I could show you uh, a lot of these, uh, and, and I won't. This was in uh, Australia just two weeks uh, ago. Uh, same kind of same kind of deal. This has people in their hotel watching the water come down the hallway. Uh, this was in China uh, two weeks ago uh, and in um, Somalia last week. Again, I could go around the world and show you lots of these, but globally these uh, big floods and mudslides are now four times more common than they were in 1980. Now, here's a little known fact. And uh, Catherine Flowers knows this very well. More than two-thirds of the waterborne disease outbreaks here in the United States come in the immediate aftermath of these flood events and these big downpours. Uh, and, and so you get to places where there are chemical waste sites, it, it becomes uh, infinitely worse 
This is the Houston Ship Canal, and most of these uh, uh, dangerous chemical sites are located adjacent to poor communities and, uh, and communities of color. As everyone knows, those who have had historically and still have to this day less economic and uh, political power to defend themselves against these insults are the ones that catch the brunt of it. This is where Catherine lives, uh, not this house, but Lowndes County. And th this is one of the people that she advocates for so persuasively. Uh, and it's a lack of sewage infrastructure. But as she pointed out in her New York Times op-ed, when these downpours come, this creates uh, huge problems. And of course, in the Torah, people are familiar with the injunction not to dump waste in any place that could be spread by flooding or scattered by the wind. The EPA, uh, um, a year and a half ago, had that same uh, uh, point on the EPA website, uh, same exact point. I went back to look at it, and it's gone now, replaced by, uh, we're currently updating. <laughs> Reminded me of another uh, passage from Scripture, um, from the book of Job, but... Uh, The flow of nutrients uh, into, from fertilizers, from pesticides, from all of the chemicals that we use are also uh, creating water quality problems around the world. This is one of these red tide events in Sydney, Australia. This was in uh, China recently. Uh, this was in Stewart, Florida. We heard about uh, Lake Erie, so I added this one to uh, the slideshow. Uh, there are lots of these uh, toxic algae uh, events now, and I'll show some more uh, tomorrow. Uh, this is the poison water uh, in Northern California and in uh, Southern California. Uh, and I just wanted to mention in passing that uh, the ocean is also being contaminated by all of the extra CO2 itself. It is absorbed by the oceans, and it changes the acidification level of the ocean. And that uh, uh, corrodes or actually prevents the congealing of the hard shell structures that coral polyps make and all cr sea creatures that have little shells, including the little zooplankton at the base of the food chain. And it, uh, the corals uh, are suffering as a result of that. One other thing, and I probably should not have included this, but it's really important to me, and it's named for my mentor in climate science uh, 50 years ago, Roger Revelle. Uh, you, don't hear, you won't hear about this anywhere else, I promise you, but it's, I also promise you it's very, very important. A huge amount of the CO2 we, re we release is absorbed by the ocean. But when it absorbs so much CO2, then it stops absorbing more and uh, the resistance grows, and warmer water, this is the Revell factor, when the oceans heat up, uh, it loses some of its capacity to, to absorb CO2. So we've been putting a lot up, and we've been absorbing some of it with trees and plants and the ocean, uh, but this is uh, in danger now. Uh, so moving, moving along, uh, we heard about fracking today, and you know, there's this uh, notion that if we just switch from coal to gas, uh, we're making real progress. Not true, in my considered opinion, so long as so much of the gas is leaking, because each molecule of methane, which is what gas is, 99%, uh, uh, has the power to trap 84 times as much heat as a molecule of CO2 over a 20-year period, and then the math gets complicated, but it's bad. Uh, and the fracking process pollutes water, and many of you here already know that. Some of you have had personal experience with it. In Pennsylvania, almost half of the well pads uh, have generated uh, water contamination complaints. Uh, and by the way, each uh, well uses 9.5 million gallons of water. And in some places in the Southwest where they're short of drinking water, 
they're turning over these enormous quantities of water for more fracking. And then places like Oklahoma, and then the earthquakes get worse, and you know, they've got a real problem there. Uh, and, and the tap water, this is from Kentucky, and we have uh, some folks who can speak with authority on this, uh, m much more than me. And the good news, uh, New York is one of the three states that has banned uh, fracking, and I hope this movement uh, grows. Now, as I, as I briefly mentioned, the relationship between uh, climate and water has to include the story of uh, drought, uh, because the same extra heat that disrupts that water cycle by vastly supercharging the water vapor and the big downpours and the floods that result also pulls it out of the soil. Right now in Argentina, this is the biggest climate-related event going on right now in, in the world. <coughs> um, our guest uh, from Chad, they had events in Chad, and she, she was probably right to cancel, but uh, Lake Chad now has only less than 4% of its original water. And uh, just to tie this to some of the violence in the region, uh, they, many of them went east toward Darfur. Uh, and of course, uh, the conflict between farmers and herders some, I'm not qualified to agree or disagree with the uh, biblical scholar who said that actually the story of Cain and Abel is a parable about the conflict between farmers and, and herders. And in this region of the world, it, it has been a conflict and the po population of livestock has uh, really exploded and this has created violence uh, in Kenya um, uh, and the horn, the entire horn of Africa this is two minutes, and I'm going to take two minutes to show you this. The Climate Reality Project shot this. Can you read the... Traditionally, rain every April and March in some places. Every August, we get rain. Every December, we get short rains. But nowadays, there is no that formula. You will only manage to get showers possibly two years. After two years, showers, not rain. This lake water to us means everything. There is no fish nowadays, let me tell you. The fish need deep water, so that's where we go and get fish. Rain drops somewhere, all of them go there, and others they don't want others to come to their side. So they kill each other because of grass and water. I was going to look at the ring for the Kayana. I was going to go to the house. 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 In the case of the lake, I blame the European government for blocking the, the Homer River. For the rain, possibly we will, we will blame the Western world. Because uh, I think the impact of their factories which have contributed the climate change. They the, the one say, they're down the corner. It will never end like a lake. That's what our people usually say. Danny, when you want to say this thing cannot finish, it's just like Lake, lake Turkana. But the way the lake is moving, I think that idiom will lose meaning. So the refugees from this region are creating uh, political stress in the regions where 
they leave uh, and in their uh, regions where they arrive. We focus on Europe. This is from Croatia, and of course it's contributed to the wave of populist authoritarianism. Uh, but the vast bulk of these refugees are going to other nations in the region, countries like Jordan, a heroic country that has been shouldering this incredible burden. But this problem is expected to continue. By mid-century, just 20, what, 32 years uh, from now, uh, they are predicting 200 million climate refugees sh from the water aspect of the crisis alone. Uh, South Africa, uh, you know that uh, Cape Town, one of the great cities of the world, almost completely ran out of water this year. Uh, there are many cities uh, lined up for this, uh, and they must prepare. Here in North America, uh, the projection through the balance of this century, the darker it is, uh, the drier it is. This is already happening. This was yesterday um, in uh, the Southwest. <coughs> and the darkest area is the uh, exceptional drought. The red is extreme drought. This panhandle of Oklahoma, by the way, perhaps it's a coincidence, uh, but that was the epicenter of the Dust Bowl. And the drought uh, in that region today is worse than it was during the Dust Bowl. I have a whole other slideshow on dust and sand, but you're in luck. I'm not going there. But in this region, it's one of the places where the underwater aquifers are being um, exploited much more rapidly than they can be recharged naturally. Uh, and, and, and by the way, Lester Brown has a book coming out. And the worst uh, of these aquifer depletions is in uh, northwestern India, uh, it's being pumped 15 times faster than it can recharge. The water table is falling in every single state in India. The Arabian uh, Peninsula, parts of California's Central Valley, the Yellow River Basin in uh, China, uh, Yemen five times uh, faster. This is uh, a, it, it's a little bit uh, vulnerable to the out-of-sight, out-of-sight, out-of-mind meme, but clearly we have the ability to monitor this and make changes. The Colorado River in this region uh, gets feeds drinking water to uh, 40 million Americans, and by the time it reaches Mexico, there's no water uh, left in the river. Now, there are age-old treaties and all of the rest, but my point is the interaction with the climate crisis is going to make this much worse. A 30 percent decline from warming alone uh, in the Colorado River by mid-century, 30 years from now, 50 percent by the end of the century. Uh, I would feel bad if I did not mention that God's creation and the web of life with which we share this earth is very much uh, affected by all of these uh, changes. Uh, Pope Francis uh, uh, said in uh, Laudato Se uh, that we have no right to do this, and indeed uh, we do not. Animal and plant species are now moving uh, toward the poles at an average rate of 15 feet per day. So I want to look briefly uh, at the uh, North Pole where the Temperature went up uh, 50 degrees warmer than normal on February uh, 25th this year. Uh, and ice in the middle of the uh, polar night, uh, the polar winter, started thawing. Uh, and <clears throat> now, this is the only complicated thing that I'm going to tell you. So please bear with me. The fact that the North Pole is heating up so rapidly is important for a couple of reasons, and one of them, the sea level rise, I'll cover in just a minute. But if you look at the entire Earth and the entire Earth climate system, it is an engine for redistributing heat from the tropics to the poles. Every system uh, wants to even itself out, and so much extra solar 
energy comes uh, on either side of the equator, the natural flow of energy is from the tropics to the poles. And the heat is transferred through ocean currents as well as wind currents. And because of the accelerated temperature increases in the Arctic and the reasons you understand, when the ice is there, the sun bounces off, and when it's not there, the heat's absorbed, 90% reflected versus 90% absorbed. Uh, so if you get a one degree increase at the equator, it may well be uh, a three times that. Actually, some scientists say uh, 12 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for a one degree Fahrenheit, but a much more rapid increase. Now here's the point, and it's complicated, and I'm sorry, but it's really important. When that ratio changes radically, all of these patterns that have been in place since the end of the last ice age are subject to change. And they are changing. You may have seen the study quoted in the newspaper two months ago about how they're measuring the Gulf Stream slowing down. And there's a whole story around that. You may have seen the story about the Northern Hemisphere jet stream getting disorganized. Well, uh, this has happened three years in a row. Uh, and uh, I went up there in 2016, I went back to Greenland and an engineer on one of the helicopters uh, I took, took this video in April of the Jakobshavn Glacier, one of the largest literally exploding, and, and this is not a time-lapse image. It looks like a computer graphics movie like the Transformers, but it's real time. And this is uh, basically why this octopus is in a parking garage in Miami. Uh, now, uh, before I close the ice-melting story, uh, this is the capital of Bolivia, and this is Hyena Potosi which provides 30% of the drinking water for La Paz. They've had an increase during the melting, but it's in grave danger. So much so that a few years ago, one of the governments of Peru sent people up into the mountains with whitewash to whitewash the rocks in hopes that they would become more reflective of the sun's rays to desperately try to slow down the disappearance of the glacier on which they depend for their water. So we're at a turning point, uh, and obviously we have a big choice to make, and there's good news, and I'm gonna round this out uh, with uh, some uplifting news. I'm sorry that some of this is hard to hear, but we do have uh, the solutions, uh, and actually the Coalition on the Environment and Jewish Life uh, put it very well. This is not only a religious and moral imperative, <clears throat> we need a strategy for security and survival. Uh, as I heard John Lewis uh, say, quoting an African proverb, when you pray, move your feet. And we do have the solutions now, and I, I'm going to do this very quickly. Wind is really taking off. It's absolutely uh, incredible. It could supply 40 times all the energy the world uses by itself. Solar is even more dramatic. We get as much energy from the sun in one hour as the entire global economy uses for an entire year. Uh, I love it when Corinna quotes, uh, she gave this amazing sermon. Fred, did you see her Earth Day sermon at Harvard's Memorial Church? Yeah, well, it's on the website. It's absolutely brilliant. And she quoted The Onion. You should all look it up. And remember, it's my daughter. And uh, uh, anyway, she quotes The Onion saying, uh, uh, scientists remind uh, uh, political leaders, uh, solar and wind ready to go whenever. Uh, new, last year here in the US, uh, this is all the new electricity generating capacity built last year. Solar and wind dominate, zero coal. By the way, the famous coal museum in Kentucky just put solar panels on its roof. <laughs> and, and for the pastors here, uh, cost savings uh, also are good uh, for congregations uh, as well. Um, solar jobs are growing nine times faster than all other jobs in the economy. Fastest growing job, second fastest wind turbine technician. 
Uh, India, look at this. This is the solar construction underway uh, in India. This is absolutely incredible. 175 gigawatts, that is a lot. Um, and electric vehicles are coming on fast, not quite fast enough, but it's a very uh, important part of the solutions. Planting trees, and in many parts of the world, this is really important. Uh, saving trees. Uh, the Hindu faith has a very specific prescription on this. Don't cut the trees. They remove the pollution. And a lot of trees are being cut, a lot of it for livestock. We have to shift agriculture from uh, factory farms to more organic uh, farming and naturally regenerative uh, farming. And I'll close by reminding everybody that we are making progress. And in the Paris Agreement, every nation in the world uh, agreed to go to net zero by mid-century. And I know what some of you are thinking. Yes, Donald Trump did make a speech. And actually, the one-year anniversary of that speech pulling out of Paris is tomorrow. Um, but what people don't often know is that under U.S. and international law, the first day the U.S. could withdraw from the Paris Agreement is the day after the next presidential election. So, and uh, if there is a new uh, president, excuse me for a moment, <laughs> then a new president could simply give 30 days notice and we're right back in the agreement, and in the meantime, the U.S. is going to exceed its commitments under the Paris Agreement. People are demanding it. Uh, uh, God bless the Standing Rock Sioux and all their allies and all of those who have marched and protested <laughs> around the country. I want to show you this march because I, this uh, is surrounding the White House, the Treasury Building, the White House there. It goes all the way around. I worked in the White House for eight years. I never imagined I would be marching on the White House. But here I am with Corinna uh, and with her daughter, Anna, and with Catherine Flowers. We're just all fired up. And uh, in any case, we can solve this. But water is life. Our access to water at the right place, at the right time, in the right quantities, and clean is in dire jeopardy, but we have the will to change. And for anyone who doubts that we do, just remember the will to change is itself a renewable resource. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry to go on too long. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Is it on? Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to basically just tell my story, and I'm going to do it briefly. Um, but I'm connecting the dots between climate change and environmental justice. Uh, again, my name is Catherine Coleman Flowers. I'm from Lowndes County, Alabama. For those of you that don't know, Lowndes County is located between Selma and Montgomery. Most of the Selma to Montgomery march went through Lowndes County. Lowndes County was also the home of the original Black Panther Party. A lot of people think that uh, the Black Panther Party started in Oakland in the Bay Area, but it actually started in Lowndes County, where there were rural people that were fighting racial oppression, and they decided to organize their own political party and ran candidates in 1966. But my story is about water. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in Lowndes County, uh, we, a lot of people, didn't have water. My parents were the working poor, my father was a civil servant who got hurt on the job and decided that he wanted to move the family back to Lowndes County. And we moved to Lowndes County. We were the only people that had a pump. We didn't have a, we had an electric pump. Everybody else in our neighborhood went to Ms. Nail's house and Ms. Nail had the manual pump. 
that you had to put water in it. I'll never forget that pump because I always liked to go because it was more fun to use Ms. Nell's pump than to turn on the faucet outside of the house because we didn't have running water in the house in order to get water to cook, clean, and whatever, and that's where people went to her pump. And when they went there, they had to pour water in the top of the pump and then pump it up and down to prime it so that the water could come out. And that was the way it was. That was in the 1960s. And then later, in the 1970s, a lot of programs came through, late 70s, early 80s. I remember when we didn't even have telephones. I remember when we first got, we got the first telephones uh, installed, people would call their next door neighbors just so that they could talk to somebody on the phone because we didn't do that before. So things started to change when it came to water and then we started getting uh, indoor plumbing. A lot of people didn't have indoor plumbing when we first moved to Lowndes County. They had outdoor toilets. And with the outdoor toilets, at least it was away from the house. But the outdoor toilets came about as, as part of the Rockefeller Sanitary Commission that was organized in the early part of the 1900s because they found out there was hookworm in the South. And it was put in place to try to find, uh, treat, find people, test them, and treat them for hookworm. And part of the solution was, was for them to build these private privies. And it gave rise to public health in uh, the southern part of the United States because before that time there wasn't really a lot of public health and what we found at least organized public health. So recently after I went back to Lowndes County to work and started to work on economic development and I found that we can't have economic development in poor communities without infrastructure. And we found that a lot of those communities were left behind. If you look at Lowndes County where they have the wastewater treatment is in the places that were traditionally white and the areas that were traditionally black didn't have wastewater treatment. They had on-site septic systems or they didn't have septic systems at all. So when I got involved in 2002, I found that the people were being arrested because they were too poor to afford these on-site septic systems. And why is that important? because at least 75% of fecal matter is water. So you can't have, you can't talk about water without talking about sanitation. And when we started looking at why uh, people couldn't, have, couldn't get these systems, we also found out that they just simply didn't work. And the reason they don't work is because they tried to create technology from a template and not take into account the earth. Our earth, in Lowndes County holds water. The reason that it has a large African American population there and throughout the Black Belt is because when the plantation owners in South Carolina and North Carolina uh, were planting cotton and tobacco and indigo, they wore out the soils and they had to move to uh, what was then the West. And when they went to the West, they built the plantations there. They weren't concerned about wastewater treatment. They were concerned about making money. Whenever people come to, to Lowndes County to visit, I always, especially reporters, because I want them to tell the whole story, not fake news. So I take them to the Equal Justice Initiative. And there at the Equal Justice Initiative, we've collected jars. And some of you may have participated in those soil collections, but we went to areas where people were lynched. And I'm tying this history together because it's all part of what we're dealing with today. And the same people that were lynched, there were 16 people. If you ever go to the <laughs> lynching memorial in Montgomery, you will see one of the columns list the names of 16 people. There were more from Lowndes County that were lynched. And as a result of, of the way uh, the soils were very, very great for growing crops, but not great for wastewater treatment, they were only concerned about being able to house enough slaves there to be able to produce what created the wealth but not deal with the wastewater issues. As years, as years, uh, as the years progress, there was still not the kind of investment there in wastewater. So I got a call back in maybe 2008 or 2009 about a family, a woman who was living in a single wide mobile home and outside of her home was uh, raw sewage. I'll never forget it because it was in October. 
And, and this is one of the things that make me know that climate change is real. In October, it had rained a lot. And this particular year, the mosquitoes, I mean, there was a time when I was growing up, you know, we had mosquito season and then they were gone. Now we can see mosquitoes in Alabama that are active and biting people through November. I have a guest that's here in the audience who came here with, went to Lowndes County with American Standard and some people in his team, uh, the first day they went out without using something to propel the mosquitoes and the next day we had to go to the drugstore first before we went to Lowndes County because the mosquitoes were so bad that they were biting one of the engineers through his beard on his face. So in October of, of that year, uh, I went there and the raw sewage was there on the ground. There was, uh, it was covered with mosquitoes and I was bitten. I had on a dress and with holes on but I had a lot of bites when I left there. And then several, and, 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 and the reason why we were there because they wanted to arrest this 26 year old woman who was pregnant because she couldn't afford on-site sanitation. But after I was bitten and, and, and my body after that broke out in a rash and I went to the doctor and I asked my doctor, so will you please test me to make sure that I don't have something because I've never had this kind of rash on my body before. So when the test results came back, they were negative. He said that nothing was wrong, but I still had this rash on my body. And what ended up happening, um, I asked her, I said, is it possible that we could have something in the United States that we're not testing people for? You know, like things that normally people don't test for here because they expect them to happen somewhere else, maybe further south. And she said, yes. As a result, I ended up reading an op-ed piece in the, New, in the New York Times that was written by uh, Dr. Peter Hotez, who is a the Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at um, Baylor. And I wrote him and I told him about my experience and we decided that we were gonna partner and do a study. We did this study, we collected fecal soil, water and blood samples and we found evidence of hookworm and other tropical illnesses in Lowndes County. It made the international news. Uh, the Guardian broke the story on September 5th of last year. A few months later, we invited the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty to come to Lowndes County. When he came there, he said that what he saw in Lowndes County was uncommon in the first world because he saw, for an example, places where people had raw sewage on the ground and just above the raw sewage were lines of water lines just above the raw sewage taking water into mobile homes. In a country where we have a president who doesn't believe in climate change, doesn't believe in justice, doesn't believe that we have a human, human right to water and sanitation, who believe that places like uh, what we had to deal with with Standing Rock should be the new normal. We all need to be involved because water is life. And without water, none of us would be here. If you look at the amniotic fluids, most of it, 90% of it is water. All of our religious ceremonies include water. I remember being immersed in the water when I was baptized. And I believe that we have to, as it is our sacred duty, as people that represent the divine, whether your divine is through whatever your religious traditions are, we have to get out there and fight for water. And one of the reasons that I fight, and I fight so hard, because I have a two-year-old grandson his name is King Josiah Hutt. His daddy insisted on naming him King. And now I understand why. Because I have to make sure that King will be able to walk the streets of the United States of America and not be a suspect. I have to also make sure that King be able to go to school and not get killed. I have to also make sure that he can have access to water and that the, 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 the people that are doing the, the destruction of the earth right now won't make it such a high commodity that he cannot afford it. Or if he decided to move to Flint and they decide that they wanna find a way to save money, that they f switch to water that will fill the homes full of lead. We have to do better. We're in places in the Central Valley where people don't have access to clean water because it's poisoned by pesticides. 
or in places where the aquifers are being drained by these factory farms. That's not where God intended. You know, there's something in the soils where we live that have nutrients that can protect us from diseases and illnesses. But if we're getting it grown halfway around the world and we're eating it, it's not providing the same type of protection. When I go to North Carolina, they have factory farms. Actually, I think very, very soon I'm going to become a vegetarian because I cannot support what is going on right now and it's creating the kinds of problems that will make sure that my grandson will have to put a lot of time into taking care of me instead of growing and prospering and doing what he can in this world. And lastly, I wanted to mention my time at Standing Rock. Because of my indigenous brothers and sisters, I, have, I, I just have so much respect for them standing up and saying that water is life and helping us to understand how we sometimes have to put our bodies on the line. Because when I went to Standing Rock, I, I was, it was a completely different, it was almost a spiritual experience for me. Because I went two days after the election of Donald Trump. Because I had to go somewhere and be around some people that gave me hope. And I found it at Standing Rock. Because there were, There were people there from around the country, and in some cases from around the world, who were putting their lives on the line to protect water. I had the opportunity to participate in water ceremonies. I mean, there was one time, one story I tell people, is almost like my con to Jesus meeting in a way when I was standing around the eternal fire. And when people were singing in their native tongues, and when I heard it, to me, it sounded like the call and response of the black church. And then I started to wonder how much of this is all intertwined and all connected like water. Because wherever you put water, eventually it'll probably come together and go all over the earth. I told my daughter, and I'm going to close with this, um, I went to Hawaii and I've always been drawn to that area and, and even um, when I went there, I just found such a kinship to the people and to the land. It was just so beautiful. And after I left, I told my daughter, I said, when I pass on, I want to be cremated. And I want you to take me back to Hawaii and pour me in the water. <laughs> but uh, after I started going down to Destin, Florida, <laughs> I changed my mind. And I told her, hopefully the currents will still be able to flow to where they're flowing now. Because I told her, I said, when I pass on, don't take me to Hawaii. Take me to Destin, because I'll end up in Hawaii. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, at this part of the program, we have some people that are going to make some comments and also ask questions, and we're going to have a conversation here, and we're going to start with my brother, Roberto Ribeiro. All right. Can we give them another hand, please? I'm a no, I'm a no. Just uh, thank you so much. Uh, my sister in the struggle, Catherine, and former President Al Gore, former Vice President. I'm hoping you see, I was still voting for you back there. But you know, where were these talks back then? We needed it, right? We need it now. So I just really want to say thank you again uh, for just being that voice for so many people and uh, being here to awaken so many people and, and just continuously bring this message forward and. and uh, you know, I'm honored to be here as, as a respondent and, and uh, to have this commentary. My name is Roberto Barrero. I work with the uh, International Indian Treaty Council. Uh, Treaty Council was one of the first uh, indigenous organizations that was accredited at the United Nations uh, back in 1977, the very first one, uh, because 
elders had come from North, Central, and South America <laughs> to say that you know, they were not getting uh, heard at the local and national level. So they had no choice but to bring their uh, voices to the international level and engage the multilateral system that became uh, the United Nations. You know, with indigenous people started going there from Chief Biscahe of the Haudenosaunee when it was the League of Nations. There was also a Maori leader who went there because again, people saw that they weren't getting heard at the local level, so they had to bring that voices out. So I see all of this as, as connected, interrelated. And, um, you know, it, it really resonates with me uh, as an indigenous person, as a Taino person. Uh, my indigenous lineage comes from the island of Boriqueng, which today people know as Puerto Rico. Uh, we're part of the, the Arawak people, the very first people in this hemisphere to be called Indians. And, uh, you know, because of the resilience of our people, there's still a few of us left, and uh, very proud of that. Uh, I was asked earlier when uh, we were talking uh, by another sister here, what's this piece that I wear? But uh, this piece that, I, that I'm wearing was uh, given to me in ceremony uh, by elders of, of my community. And, and it really links to water. If, if you, you have a chance to look at it, uh, maybe afterwards, I was told also besides my comment to make an announcement that we are running a little late, but after this there'll be a reception. So please don't go, that this, this will still be happening. But um, there's, a, there's a person here uh, who's in kind of like a fetal position. And so that, this reminds us of when we were children, connected to the water. For us, uh, the great spirit of the creator is, is, starts out in the female energy, then, then converts uh, to the sun, etc. So we have a real connection. So for us, in our language, one of the ways we say it is ni tok akuhu, is uh, water is life, right? Uh, that's, that's the one way that we say it. And I was just thinking uh, about everything that you presented and uh, the things that you said and, and, and the interlinkages and thinking about our current state in the world and wondering how um, you see the interdependency of, of movements uh, at, at this time. Uh, because uh, some people on the news and, and uh, the, who are very concerned about the threat uh, to the multilateral uh, system, for example, you know, the US pulling out of Paris or, or wanting to pull out of Paris has set forth another you know, series of unfortunate events, you might say. And uh, you know, we see the rise of these author authoritarian governments and regimes, uh, racists coming full out. And you know, we have a convention uh, on the elimination of, of racial discrimination. It's one of the few that the US is actually a signatory uh, to, one of the few international conventions. And so um, you know, in these talks about climate change, as we're trying to encourage uh, people of faith uh, to take this on as a moral issue. I'm wondering also, you know, where is, where is a talk or is there room also to bring up the human rights issue? You know, for indigenous peoples, you know, you talk about um, human rights. You know, for us, really, if, if you think about it, you look at the trajectory of history, we were only acknowledged as humans in 2007 when the United Nations passed the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, that we were finally acknowledged to have human rights as indigenous peoples. And so that's why this is very important for us moving, moving forward, why we fight so hard, because it's all connected, right? Our land, uh, the declaration twice brings up water, right? But now we see a, a, a threat as we were moving forward, progressing, standing rock. We, uh, Treaty Council and others help bring a special rapporteur out there uh, on the rights of indigenous people. Uh, I was there during that time. We brought another uh, person from the Human Rights and, and Business uh, Council over there. Uh, to bring that, and you know, that visibility formed part of the pressure that was being put on the current administration at the time. And then, you know, towards the end, we had that that uh, announcement that they were going to do the environmental impact study. You know, once the administration changed, however, that stopped, and we know what happened at Standing Rock afterwards. So, uh, what I'm wondering is, in this movement, where you're calling for um, people of faith. Uh, to be part of this, you know, to get this moral imperative to move forward uh, in the fight against this climate crisis. You know, where is, where is the human rights conversation? Is there, do you see a need for it? Do you see that this is important? Do you see this, uh, uh, what's happening now is a threat? But that, that's where I wanted to open up the conversation as, as a Taino person, person who's been affected by, uh, who has family and, and, and community affected by the hurricane, uh, who know uh, the sacredness of water. And I just, want, again, wanted to thank you and, and see what you had to say about that. Hmm. Want to go first? Uh, 
Well, can you hear me? Okay. Um, we have been using the human rights framework as it relates to water. I'm part of the National Coalition for the Human Rights to Water and Sanitation. Uh, we gave testimony before the UN Rap Special Rapporteur on the human right to water and sanitation. Um, Katerina D. Albuquerque, when she visited the United States. Uh, we have also, there are groups that are around the United States that are using the human rights framework because we realize we may have to use that because we may not be able to use the courts uh, under the current regime. Uh, there are people in uh, the People's Water Board in Detroit that are working on water affordability issues using the human rights framework. People in Flint, uh, the people in Martin County, Kentucky. I'm gonna meet um, some people from there that are doing some active work. I think Nina McCoy and her husband, I'll be meeting them. They'll be coming to Lowndes County. So we are also working with people, uh, the Environmental Justice Coalition for Water in California. Uh, part of going to Standing Rock, we're standing on human rights. So there are a lot of groups now using that framework as a way in which to, um, to find solutions because they're the same greedy people that are trying to extract, also want to, they want to put water in a position where it becomes a commodity and we have to pay for it. And in Detroit, for an example, there, I know about a month ago we were talking about they were predicting 17,000 water shutoffs. And when they take, when they uh, turn the water off, they not only, uh, they have criminalized turn the water back on, and they also want to take children away from the families, charge the families with neglect if they can't afford those high water bills because of the infrastructure uh, problems that they have there. So we have to, uh, we're using that framework to try to address some of these problems. I agree with what Catherine has said, and I'll just add a very brief uh, addendum. Uh, yes, hum the human rights framework is extremely important, but I'd like to turn this uh, slightly on its side because all of us who are citizens of the United States of America, I know, I know there are many from other countries here, but I want to address this mainly to my fellow Americans. We have the right to vote. This is now about political power. It is now about, if I may use the phrase from our uh, Filipina colleague, it is now about people power. If we could register to vote and get to the polls, 50% of the unregistered African-American voters in Mississippi, we could win two Senate seats this November and fill them with people who would not put up with some of the outrages and abuses that we are seeing on a regular basis from this Congress. If we can have a massive wave, regardless of what political party you're in, it's not a partisan politically tribal issue. It's about the Constitution of the United States. It's about our basic right as a people to have dignity, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and not be regularly insulted and abused and outraged. Every time a new outrage comes along now, I have to download some existing outrage to make room for the new outrage. <coughs> and there is a remedy for that. Instead of having a supine, obsequious, cowardly legislative branch that refuses to discharge its constitutional responsibility, if enough people register to vote and vote, we can change all of that in the next six months. <laughs> Sorry. I think we got three more. Yeah, please. Introduce yourselves, please. Uh, we, yeah. Um, hello, Raina Thiel. Um, I'm a former Obama White House official. I was his liaison to tribes and also an advisor on climate change. And I've been told to make this really quick, so I'm going to cut down my comments a little bit. But just to tell you a really quick anecdote before I get to my actual question. 
Back in 2015, I had the opportunity to take President Obama to my home state of Alaska. I'm Alaska native, Dina Inna Athabaskan and Yupik, and so it was a huge, hugely important um, thing for me and for my state. Um, and I was also able to bring him above the Arctic Circle, and he was the first president in the history of the presidency, uh, sitting president, to go above the Arctic Circle. And it was a climate change focused trip, and some folks asked during that trip, you know, wh why is he going to Alaska? Because a lot of folks don't know what uh, the vice president was talking about a little earlier um, about the Arctic and how it's warming exponentially faster than the rest of the country. And the impact on indigenous populations is, is intense. It's, an, it's staggering if you look at it. We literally have homes that are falling into the ocean because of the rising sea levels. We have changes in marine mammal um, migration paths. Uh, we have uh, the methane, which is coming out of our permafrost, as our permafrost melts. They say about 50% of the methane trapped in the soil in the world is trapped in permafrost, and that is currently melting. Um, and so we see all these staggering, staggering impacts, and I feel like everybody's wondering across the world who don't, who don't see these things necessarily on a daily basis, but they're wondering, you know, when are we going to wake up and start doing something to really address in as serious a manner as we need to uh, climate change and greenhouse gas emissions? And so that's my somewhat impossible question for the two of you is, um, and it's a, one that I can't answer and I've been wondering over and over again in my own mind, but what is the threshold? What is the threshold? What has to happen globally on a global scale in order for us as a human society to come together and to actually address climate change and take it as seriously as we need to before it's too late. We already see these effects like in Maryland and Ellicott City, like these horror scenes which would come out of, you know, just 10 years ago, a movie on the um, apocalyptic effects of, of climate change. We are, we're seeing some of that and yet there's not a lot going on. Instead, we're pulling out of the Paris Agreement and going about our merry way with, with our emissions. So that's my question is, what is that threshold? What is it going to take? How many lives will have to be lost before you think we're going to wake up? Hmm. If, if I could go first on that, um, it's a really important question. And no one can answer it with precision, but I have a very strong feeling about it. You know, in, uh, in technology, uh, there are these uh, exponential curves that, you know, Moore's Law, and we've seen what's happened with mobile phones and computers and all that. Uh, and there's a point where it starts to inflect and then it just changes completely. Um, an economist uh, in the last century, Rudy Dornbush, once said, uh, things take ha longer to happen than you think they will but then they happen much faster than you thought they could. And I have seen in my lifetime how that pattern sometimes plays out in politics and in political consciousness. When I was a young boy in, in Tennessee, I remember times when some of my friends would make, uh, I, I mean, you know, like 10, 11, 12 years old, I, I remember one point in particular where one of my friends made some racist comment and another friend said, hey, shut up, man, we don't talk that way anymore. And it was right at the moment when uh, America was coming to its uh, realization in its soul that we really ha have to change the way we think about race. And it's a journey and we're still on the journey and it's uh, Obviously, we have a long way to go. However, when uh, the civil rights laws were passed, the Voting Rights Act was passed, when Barack Obama was elected president, we have already seen milestones that really convince us that uh, something profound uh, is changing, has changed, needs to more, but is changing. Another example, if someone had uh, told me six, seven years ago that uh, in the year 2018, uh, gay marriage would be legal in all 50 states, uh, accepted, honored, and celebrated by two-thirds of the American people, I, 
I would have said, well, I sure hope so, but what are you smoking? Because that just seems completely detached from what's realistic. But it happened, and in previous ages, women got the right to vote. Slavery was abolished. Uh, apartheid was uh, ended. The nuclear arms race was uh, changed. Uh, and in every one of those cases, there was a threshold, to use your word, that we crossed. And uh, as we crossed that threshold, the, the underbrush was cleared away, the complications faded into the background, and the binary choice appeared between what's right and what's wrong. And once that choice is crystallized, that's the threshold, in my opinion. And I think we are right at that threshold where the climate crisis is concerned. And I think it is connected to these other dawning realizations of who we are uh, as a people, who God made us to be, what our purpose is. And yes, it's difficult, but in the aggregate, I think that we are crossing that threshold now. The Paris Agreement was a good sign of it. Uh, the, the business, so many businesses and corporations now that deal with the public are hearing from their customers that, uh, uh, you, you know, you, got, you, you better align with the new values that we have or we're not, you know, going to... And I love the comment on, uh, from Sanofi, the uh, manufacturer of Ambien, uh, uh, <laughs> yesterday when, when, when they said racism is not a known side effect of this. But they preceded it by saying that our employees come from every race, creed, color, uh, and, and background. Uh, and any business person now, or most business people will tell you that when they go to try, try to hire young people, now the best and brightest coming out of in, uh, institutions of higher learning, they've got to convince them that their values are aligned. So there's a generational change aspect of this threshold. But I think that we're crossing it now, I really do. <laughs> It'll come on. Hello? Yes. I'm Sister Robbie Pentecost, and um, I'm a Franciscan sister, and I've been working in the Appalachian region for over 25 years. Um, and it's been a, a true blessing and a, a real study of the impact that climate change is having um, and the impact that a lot of the industries, particularly coal, plays on climate change. Uh, I've been to homes where children are playing in orange water. Uh, I've been to homes where they have to open the windows to turn on the water faucet because of the methane gas going through the water pipes. People in Appalachia have often been set to the side. Um, and so um, I've also worked a, a lot in this time in Appalachia with women. And I've started to study some of the women and, and issues and how women play an important role when it comes to water issues. And so um, I, I, I laugh about Martin County and Nina. Uh, Martin County, who has been, or which has been one of the largest producers of coal, now has a bankrupt water system. So coal has contributed a lot to that community, uh, or so they claim. And I, I think that can be said across Appalachia and across the United States, that many of these industries have impacted. Uh, but women have been at the forefront of addressing those issues. And so my question is around the women and how we can empower the women, uh, how we can raise up the voices of women who are doing some of the work and that we can join forces. And how can we get those women in our leadership positions or in decision-making positions in our churches to, to speak truth to power? Um, I think sometimes our churches, when we ask for the leadership, it tends to be men. And I think the women have an innate understanding. I mean, the UN has documented that women are critical to addressing the water issues. And so I'd like to just hear from you of any insights that we can raise up the voices of women.
Well, in my work, I see a lot of women that are out there on the front lines. Uh, we have a documentarian who's here today doing, uh, documenting me here because she's been around the country documenting women like Nina McCoy and the work that she's doing. People in Detroit, the people that are on the front lines in Detroit fighting for wa the right, human right to water or women. Uh, when I went to Standing Rock, the women were the ones that were doing the water ceremony. Uh, the water walkers or women. I think that what we have to do is lift up those stories to inspire other women to get involved. And uh, one of the things that's happening that I've seen happen in Alabama is that a lot of women are also running for public office. So just to... Just to uh, to, to piggyback on what uh, the former vice president just said is that we not only need to vote, we need to run for office too. And I think that uh, we, in, around the world, uh, water, women around the world know how important water is because we have to have water to care for our families. So if we could lift up the stories and continue to lift up the stories of those women that are doing this work around the United States, I think we can inspire other women. And we also need to encourage a lot of those women to run for office. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Catherine Flowers, and thank you, Vice President Gore, for your presentation. Uh, my name is Jonathan Soto, and I'm Associate Vice President of Strategic Initiatives here at Union Theological Seminary. And I have a very specific question, uh, and I have two specific reasons for that question. Um, under the human rights law, what body or committee at the United Nations can Puerto Ricans petition uh, for the human rights violation that resulted from the waterborne illness deaths that came from a misleading EPA statement that certain um, wells and Superfund sites were safe. I asked this question because first, anecdotally, I was part of a group. I, at the time, was a senior advisor for Mayor de Blasio, and we had gone um, to San Juan to support Mayor Carmen Yulín Cruz. At that time, I have over 200 family members that live in Aguada, Puerto Rico. And I had my family members reaching out to me because they did not have enough water to drink. I did not have enough water to bring them, even though I was coming from the city of New York, and even though I was in San Juan, they did not have enough water to drink. And there were not only reports, but in the region where I live, in Puerto Rico and in my hometown, there were people that die because they were drinking from EPA Superfund sites and because they were drinking rat infested urine. Additionally, the second part of the question and the reason why I referenced the United Nations is because this Saturday is the start of hurricane season. And in light of the 5,000 plus deaths that the Harvard study and that the New England Journal uh, found, which actually supersedes the combined death totals that we saw in Hurricane Katrina and in 9-11, we are trying to petition the UN Special Committee on Decolonization because unfortunately Puerto Ricans on the island, even though they are eligible for the United States draft, even though they pay federal taxes, they cannot vote for the presidency of the United States. Therefore, we are a colonized territory and because it is literally a matter of life and death, and because we see this slow-moving genocide happening against Puerto Ricans, we need to find out what contacts do you have at the United Nations to raise this issue so that we could break the door, not break the door, we could knock on their doors um, this Saturday and really ask why is it that the EPA was able to make this specific misleading statement, which we saw reported by CNN on November, actually October 31st. Because in 2016, there was a specific EPA Superfund site that this statement says as follow. In 2006, the Dorado EPA Superfund site and the sampling found that there were chemical contamination that is impacting wells used to supply drinking water to the local communities. Drinking water with these solvents and these chemicals can have serious health impacts, including damage to the liver and increasing the risk of cancer. Donald Trump then visited Puerto Rico, threw paper towels at our people, and then when we saw 
that these deaths were happening, then the EPA spokesperson, specifically Elias Rodriguez, which we see as colonized people, the United States uses our people to make these false statements, where they stated as follows. The water being pulled from the wells at the Dorado groundwater contamination site, which is part of the Superfund program for hazardous waste, meets federal drinking water standards for certain industry chemicals, said the EPA, two years after it said in 2016 that wasn't the case. The water is okay to consume based on the analysis that we've done. This is patently false. These are crimes against humanity. And how can Puerto Ricans, which are a colonized people and which cannot vote for the presidency of the United States, even though we can be drafted into the military, how can we petition the UN for these gross violations of our human rights? <laughs> I don't know the answer to your question, uh, but I'll be glad to look into it for you. Um, I already said my piece about how what, what a what a disgrace it was, and it was a racist response. It really was. It's obviously so. Just one minor thing I would add: uh, a very large number of Puerto Ricans have moved, maybe temporarily, uh, maybe some will stay longer, uh, to Florida and to Texas uh, and some other places here in New York. Uh, in Florida, they can vote this fall for either a climate denier or a climate supporter for U.S. Senate. In Texas, they can vote either for a climate denier or a climate supporter for U.S. Senate. Uh, and, and they could tip the balance in both states if the Puerto Rican diaspora actually really gets serious about this, mobilizes, gets on the the social media, flip Florida, flip, well, keep the great Senator Bill Nelson in Florida, and flip Texas. I'm getting too political here, Fred, to get that Ted Cruz out of there. But Puerto Ricans can play a big role, and I hope that you and others in the Puerto Rican community will really mobilize on this election. Unfortunately, we are out of time for questions from the floor. Let's give both Catherine Flowers and Vice President Gore Catherine, another round. Always of enjoy it. <laughs> and I want to personally thank them on behalf of Union Seminary for their incredible leadership uh, on this issue and so many others, but particularly on this issue. Um, your, your voices are needed. Uh, the leadership is needed, and we are so pleased and proud here at Union through the leadership of Corinna Gore that we have access to you, but that we also have the ability to make you available to the larger public and particularly the community here at Union. So thank you both. Thank you. Let me invite the, everyone to a reception in the refectory, which is just behind you and slightly up the stairs. Let me also say, please join uh, Jonathan Soto and others at the UN on Saturday. You can find information about it on the uh, Union website. And that sermon that the Vice President mentioned that was given at Harvard Memorial uh, Chapel back in April, you can also find that on the Union website, the Harvard website, and the Center for Earth Ethics great. website. All right. Great. Have great. a great night. <laughs>